I could stand up here and begin to talk about my dad and his career achievements or milestones, but we already have seen, heard, and read about them. There'd be a lot to say and not enough time, so I won't talk about that. My father was different and special. He had unique qualities which would separate him and make him, as he would say, not the best, but just better than the rest. He ruled the unruly horse, calmed the nervous horse, and willed the unwilling horse. To him, driving a horse was like sitting in a chair or breathing for us. It was just a natural born thing to do. Driving horses was life. And when we hadn't driven for seven years, he got beat down and a part of him died then too. But during these seven years, it allowed and called upon my father to reflect and spend more time with his family. It was during this period when his true champion spirit shined through. There is a saying that the true measure of a champion is not if they fall, but if they get back up. And I made sure my father got back up and got to that 15,000 win milestone. Throughout his career, my father never really was your typical Grand Circuit driver. To him, driving a Grand Circuit course was easy. They were well-mannered, spoiled, primetime athletes who were bred to race and knew what to do. A bad move on a good horse made you look good. So to him, it was easy. But driving overnights, that was more challenging and gave more of a thrill to himself and more importantly to the caretaker who'd spent countless hours caring and prepping for the races. My father rooted for the underdog as he himself started out as an underdog, coming from a small farming town with three boys to a room and two horses to a stall. He liked to say he was born in a horse's feet tub. It was that feet on the ground connection that allowed my father to succeed. Rather than go into a fancy restaurant with an owner or try to win over an account with the trainer, my father would rather stay back and play gin rummy to the morning dawn or shoot eight ball. He was a guy's guy. As young boys growing up, my brothers and I idolized our dad. Before there was internet, I used to give my father his seasonal year to date win count on his quest to beat 800 wins in a season. I also remember Saturdays and Sunday afternoons right here at Freehold Raceway waking up early, hitting the bagel store, and grabbing a sports eye racing form. Along the way, my dad and his driver, Jimbo, would bicker to each other in their classic fraternizing way, followed by my father asking Jimbo if he knew how much he loved his papa, which is what he'd call my brother, Andrew. We listened to Elvis, Elvis, and more Elvis, coupled with the little Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash, while my brother and I would laugh listening to my father sing out of tune and destroy a song. And like little ducklings in a row, we followed our father into the back paddock of Freehold or Yonkers, or we'd pull into a grassy field parking lot with the New Jersey fair tracks, where I would become my, per my father's personal valet by getting his whip, polishing his driving boots and helmet, all the while thinking that it's time for dad to become her day. We were loyal to our father, and it was a trait that was learned and passed down to us by our older brother, Dooner, AKA Herbie Jr. Loyalty and constant companion are understatements when you say Herve Jr. If you watch when my father won the little brown jug with Hot Hitter on YouTube, you'd see a little boy wearing a baseball cap with a program in his back pocket, bouncing around in excitement and adulation, acting as if he was staring at a Greek mythical god as my father performed that iconic moment of standing in the bike heading back to the winner's circle. That loyalty continued all the way to his final days with Junior never leaving his side in the hospital. For three long weeks, that Dad fought the underdog battle and surprised us all, doctors included. That loyalty will continue as Junior takes over the reins and will watch over your granddaughter, Angelina, becoming her new Lala, which she would call you. But at the end of the day, for my father, it really wasn't about himself. It was about his family, fellow horsemen, and racing fans. He always wanted others to be happy. Numerous times at his own expense, he'd fly his own helicopter or jet to make guest appearances at various tracks, willing to drive anything or support anyone because again, it wasn't about him. It was about the sport, or as he would call it, the industry. People wanted to see him, and that's how he gave back to the sport. This is tough. Earlier this week, I witnessed and felt my father's spirit and how he continues to give back. Before and after each and every race that I drive, I'd call up my dad to find out what I did right and what I did wrong. 
he would always tell me that I never lost because you either win or you learn. You live and learn, as he'd say. Late last week, I had gone through my father's trunk looking for his best colors to bury him in. And I had come across some special pan clips that I actually needed for my suit. But there was this one racing whip, which was right there in front of me, and it dawned on me that it was the last whip my father had used in his last race, which was at the Legends Day at Clinton Raceway in August of 2013. Fast forward to this Monday at Monticello Raceway, where my pacing there had been entered prior to my father's passing. I made a decision that I wanted to race, and of course I was going to use that whip I found in his trunk in honor of my dad. It was a beautiful day with a Catskills mountain breeze in the air, and I was in the post parade. I found myself talking to my dad. I was just letting him know that I missed him, and everything is okay, and will be okay, and that I will still talk to him after that race. And if you believe in any form of religion or afterlife as I do, then of all places at that very moment, I knew my father would be with me, but little did I know that his spirit would be sitting next to me the entire time during that race. I thought I heard him say, relax to me at the half. Turning for the stretch, my, resp my mare responded to every crack of his whip. I felt like when I yelled, he was yelling right there next to me. I never thought I would get up in time, but she stuck her nose out, just getting up in true Herve fashion. And my father, my family, and I won. And as luck would have it, paid $13 even to win. <laughs> for that moment in time, my champion father picked us up during this time of sorrow. I wasn't, supposed to have, I wasn't supposed to have won from where I was in the race, but I felt that my father needed to give us a little more something to talk about as he had done his whole life. Was it divine intervention or luck? I think it was a little bit of both because as my father did always say, I'd rather be lucky than good any day of the week. I look forward to driving to talk to my father again, because if there's any place he'd rather be, he would be out on that track alongside me. I know my dad will continue to bless and watch over our family and all fellow horsemen. He had a ton of sayings, of which, it, of which was, it's not who you are, but what they say you are. And I would simply add to this by saying, it's not what you have, it's who you have. Our mother, Barbara, the woman who gave life to his six kids, reassured to, his to my father in his final hours that it was okay to let go and that it will be okay and to be with his parents and his brothers, Uncle Henry, Gilles, and Andre, waiting for him in heaven in the winter circle. So to our dad, the luckiest man around, the Colonel, the Babe Ruth, the Old Bridge icon, the just The just the passenger with the middle name good. The man with the golden hands. And most importantly, Hervé. And that's all you gotta say. We love you.